All right, I think we have a thumbs up from Zoom. Sound is working, lovely. So housekeeping of hybrid events almost out of the way, but it is a pleasure to welcome our in-person crowd and our online crowd for those who are joining us remotely. <coughs> My name is Jacqueline Sundberg. I'm outreach librarian for the Rare Books and Special Collections, and it's a real pleasure to welcome David Austin tonight. My colleague Jennifer is going to give a proper introduction to David in a moment, but I'm just going to take care of a couple housekeeping notes. It's a pleasure to really to host David because we, we tried to have you come last year and an event Long delayed means much anticipation, and it's exciting to get to celebrate your work, your new, the reissue of your book, and to hear more about it tonight. Um, so do uh, take a moment at the end of the event as well. I'll introduce, if you want to give a wave at the back of the room, we have our colleague and friend from the Word Bookstore, who's going to be handling sales in person. And we also have the option of sales online. We'll put a link in the chat if you want to purchase a copy of Professor Austin's book. Before I pass the podium, although that would be quite hard, it's large. Before I step out of frame, let's put it that way, um, <laughs> and let Jennifer take over, I just want to take a moment um, for a couple housekeeping things. The first and most important is an acknowledgement of where we are, and that's here in on site in the McGill University Library. And this building, the McLennan Library building, is located on land that has long served as a place of meeting and exchange amongst Indigenous nations including the Haudenosaunee and the Anishinaabe nations. And we honor and recognize and respect these nations as, as the traditional stewards of the place and the lands and waters on which we meet today. And this month is a celebration of black history nationwide. And it's really a pleasure uh, to be able to host this event in February, although we would be happy to have you during any month of the year. <laughs> um, if February worked out for the schedule and we're happy to have you. For the online crowd, if you do need to reach out, if you have technical trouble, or if you, let me know if the microphone needs to be louder, just send a message in the chat. You can also put questions there for Professor Austin, and we will have a Q&A at the end. I'll voice the questions from the online room. For those in the room, we will revoice your questions so that the online crowd can hear them. Um, I think that's the end of housekeeping. So I will step out and let, the, let Jennifer take over. Thanks, Jacqueline. Welcome everyone, good afternoon. Today's speaker, David Austin, is an author, an editor, and an educator. He's currently teaching in the Humanities, Philosophy, and Religion Department at John Abbott College. And he's a lecturer in the McGill Institute for the Study of Canada. And I first met David Austin here in our library when he brought a group of students into our Rare Books collection to have a look at the Roy State's Black History Collection. I think it's appropriate if I take a moment to show you a few slides of this collection. Mr. Roy States, born 1919, was a black activist, amateur <coughs> historian, and McGill staff member. He began collecting books as a 16 year old in New Glasgow, Nova Scotia, when he found that his local library had only two books on the subject of black history, the black experience in Canada. So he said about a lifetime love of collecting. Here's some examples from our monographic collection. We have some 700 monographs, primarily dating from the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s. And a wonderful collection of community newspapers. Here's the Montreal Oracle. Toronto is represented as well. Nova Scotia, of course. And beyond community, there's radical press as well. Quite a lot of ephemera, community initiatives, and a large number of newspaper clippings representing Mr. States' own writing, his editorials to newspapers, presentations that he gave at conferences and community gatherings. He also exhibited, particularly on Canadian military history, which was a passion. All of this is here and available in our Rare Books reading room. You need only make an appointment. You'll find um, an augmented and expanded description of this fantastic collection in our online catalog. Um, but back to today's speaker, Mr. Austin. <laughs> 
David Austin, author of Dread Poetry and Freedom, Linton Quasi Johnson and the Unfinished Revolution, published 2018. He's author of Fear of a Black Nation, Race, Sex, and Security in 60s Montreal, first published in 2013, and winner of the 2014 Casa de las Americas Prize. It's now in its second edition, of course, already listed by the Hill Times Top 100 Books of 2023. As editor, David has worked on Moving Against the System, the 1968 Congress of Black Writers, and the Making of Global Consciousness, 2018. And You Don't Play with Revolution, the Montreal Lectures of C.L.R. James, 2009. His C.L.R. James Philosopher of the Dispossessed will be published in 2025. David has produced radio documentaries for CBC Ideas, on CLR James and Franz Fanon, and recently served as a consultant for the CBC television documentary series, Black Life, Untold Stories. Please give a warm welcome to Mr. David Austin. How's everybody doing? <laughs> Good. Good. Good to see you all here. Thanks for coming. Um, <clears throat> just want to say thank you to Christopher Lyons, who's not here today. Um, we talked about having this conversation talk <clears throat> last year. It didn't work out for various reasons. Um, uh, Timing wasn't good, but also, you know, there was a lot going on last month, as there is this month in terms of Black History Month events. And I think it's also important to seed space, you know. Sometimes you find yourself doing many things, and it's important to recognize that there are other folks doing things too, and to create the space for other folks to do those things. Um, also, thanking, thanks to Justin, uh, sorry, Jacqueline Sundberg, and also Jennifer Garland for their involvement in this, and also Brendan. King Edward's in the back, who's uh, selling the books from Word Bookstore. Um, when I moved back to Montreal in 1990, um, I think Word, Word was the first bookstore I visited. And I've been buying books from that bookstore since since then. So that's what, 30, 34 years? It's a long time. So many of the books that I have in my home come from that bookstore. Um, Yeah, so like I said, we've been trying to do this since last year. Um, as my grandmother used to say, nothing comes before time. So the timing seems to be good. Um, this edition of the book was not out last year when we began having this conversation. And, you know, I don't take it for granted when I'm asked to speak or to give a talk, right? Because it means somebody has thought about you and the work that you do and not taken that for granted and um, asked you to participate in something. And it's also always an opportunity to be in dialogue and break bread with folks. I think we need more of those kinds of conversations. So this, this event is a bit of a launch. It's actually the first public event I've done since the new edition of this book has been out, um, in part because from May until well into the fall, I was dealing with long COVID symptoms, including brain fog and fatigue, which I wouldn't wish on anybody, at least maybe not on most people. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> um, but it's also appropriate that we're having this event here because in many respects, <clears throat> this is where this book begins. Um, <clears throat> I was a high school student in Toronto um, where I used to spend a lot of time at Third World Books and Crafts on Bathurst Street, downtown Toronto. And, you know, it was there that I discovered a book by Walter Rodney called The Groundings with My Brothers, a series of short essays based on lectures that he delivered in 1968-67. And then I realized that three of those lectures were delivered right here in Montreal 
to, to during the Congress of Black Writers in 1968, which took place just up the street from here on, Mac, on McTavish. And one after he was, ex, um, actually all three of them, one after the Congress of Black Writers, actually, um, after he was expelled from Jamaica um, for his the political work that he and Walter Rodney, uh, sorry, C. L., uh, Robert Hill, who you may have seen in one of the clips of the, the film that was just playing, um, were involved in in the 1960s. So all of that was my first kind of clue that alerted me to the fact that there was something historic about the politics that had emerged and unfolded in Montreal in the 1960s. And in retrospect, it's um, one of the reasons why I moved back to Montreal. You know, I don't think I was consciously thinking about it at that time, but when I think about it in hindsight, um, that was a very big part of it. Um, I became involved as a member of the Black Students Network, uh, where we organized activities that brought a range of people to this campus, including the same Robert Hiller, who I mentioned, people like uh, Horace Campbell, um, Barbara Ransby, and a range of thinkers uh, who were doing historical and public political work. Um, I was an editor of the McGill Daily, where we began to dig out archives about the Congress of Black Writers and events that unfolded in Montreal in the 1960s and 70s, um, which were captured in that newspaper, which at the time in the 1960s, uh, people were reading that newspaper the way they would read the Gazette. They would come off campus, come on campus to read it. So it's a very different time in that sense. right? So I then realized that a lot of this historical experience is captured in student newspaper archives and also RCMP state security archives, which, um, which is a whole other story, which is part of this story. And um, it's one of those ironies that, that, that because of security and surveillance, so much of what we understand to be, you know, black politics and history and that of indigenous peoples and any group that was part of the left, right? Those archives are not available to those groups and organizations and people. <clears throat> but they're there sort of in, you know, immaculate order in those archives, right? And they're really an underused source in terms of capturing that, that historical experience. Um, <clears throat> so, in many ways, as I said, this is where the story of Fair for Black Nation begins. But, you know, it's also tied to more contemporary events. Um, the 1990s was a period where a number of individuals, I can name them, some of them, Marcellus Francois, uh, Don, Donovan Easy Fletcher, among others, who have been killed by police officers, right? right? And of course, there have been more of those more recently, all of which sort of led some of us to start thinking about, so where, what's the impetus? Where does this come from? Right? And I think this has been an ongoing question that we've been posing and what the book attempts to sort of respond to in some ways from a from a historical experience, right? But all of this was part of a process of kind of coming of age on this university campus um, with people like Melanie Newton, who gave a talk last week, um, people like Adrian Hayward, Astrid Jack, Pat Hayward, Mariam Kaba, who many of you would know for our work on prison abolition, uh, people like Shungu Sabeta and others, you know, this was really a moment where I've kind of, there was this kind of crystallization of our politics and, and many of us are still very close friends uh, today. So I mentioned Melanie Newton, who she gave this wonderful talk last week um, on black and indigenous politics and solidarity. Um, and Melanie's one of the reasons why, along with Robert Hill, the Garvey historian and historian of kind of Pan-African movements, why I don't claim to be a historian because the kind of work that goes in terms of archiving, I mean, in terms of using archives, the kind of meticulous and assiduous work, right? Um, the kind of work that Melanie Newton does and that Robert Hill, Robert Hill does. Um, it's not that I haven't done some of that work, but that kind of ongoing work, very conscious and deliberate work, um, both in-depth and expansive, and the consistent consistency with 
that, of that work is a different kind of work than drawing on history and using history as a kind of methodology to pose some questions about the present, which is not to say that historians don't do that too. Um, but I just want to, it's also a way of kind of getting out of the, the accusation or escaping the accusation that, you know, well, you didn't cover X, Y, and Z or something is missing. Well, I'm saying, well, that wasn't necessarily the entire intention, which is actually also, also true. But for me, you know, history is a political methodology in many respects, drawn on the past in order to make sense of the present and to imagine possible futures. Um, futures that take us beyond the mess that Melanie Newton talked about last week during her present presentation. Um, you know, when I was an undergraduate here, there were maybe four or five professors of African descent on campus. It was a very different time. And the other day I had this experience of listening to some of my students, two of them happened to be black, trying to figure out what courses they could take because there are so many, well, I don't wanna say so many, there were enough professors on campus now that courses overlap with each other. Right? Now, I'm saying that Yes, to acknowledge that there are more black professors on campus, but I'm also saying that to acknowledge that this has been part of a process that goes back some 30 plus years, where some of us who were students here, involved in the Black Students Network, were advocating for an Africana Studies program and also for um, more black professors. Right. So all of this, I see, is an integral part of this of this of this struggle. And we were drawing on the work of people who were politically active in the 1960s to think about the moment that we were in in the 19, 1990s. All right. So the title of today's talk, Black Politics in Dark Times, uh, Fear of a Black Nation After 10 Years. I'll say a bit more about the title of the book <clears throat> in a moment. Um, but of course, it's a play on blackness and darkness. And for, I don't think any of my, any students I've had in my class, there's a book that I use called Blackness and Modernity by Cecil Foster. It's about 800 pages, pages long. It's kind of a philosophical text, you know, kind of Hegelian phenomenological text, which I've sort of oppressed my students with <clears throat> over the past couple of years. Um, but one of the things he talks about is symbolic and somatic blackness, right? And <clears throat> I think the black politi politics part should be obvious, but maybe the dark times part needs to be explained a little bit. Right? So what are these dark times and what is this moment that we're in? It's a moment of ongoing dispossession of indigenous peoples on the continent and across the Americas. And this is one of the things that Melanie Newton talked about last week. Perpetual homelessness, high rates of incarceration, poverty and negative health indices for black and indigenous peoples right here in Canada and across North America. Equally alarming terms, in ter alarming figures in terms of unemployment, underemployment, incarceration, and being entangled in the criminal justice system, again, right here in Canada. The impossible cost of housing, food, the official privatization of healthcare, and a COVID pandemic that reminded us that we're, that pandemics disproportionately impact some people differently, including in the global South, and people of color and the poor in North America and Europe. The kinds of crass inequalities, callous accumulation of wealth and the increase, increasing pauperization of people in the global south. Climate catastrophe, the dumping of toxic, toxic waste in general, uh, particularly to, close to black and indigenous neighborhoods and communities in North America. Rising sea levels that threaten the very existence of the Caribbean, places like the Bahamas, Trinidad and Tobago, but also in the South Pacific Islands, the Maldives, Tuvalu, the Marshall Islands, and the threats to the ecosystems, 
and general way of life. The ongoing crisis in the Great Lake region, and particularly in the Democratic Republic of Congo, largely tied to mineral resources, such as the heat resistant metallic coltan found in our cell phones and electronic devices. Congolese, including children, are killed every day so we can use and discard many computers, our cell phones, that we carry around in our hands. We marvel at the size and complexity of these devices right, as we take them for granted, but in many ways we're literally carrying blood in our hands. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, there's a situation in Gaza, right? And I think it's impossible to talk about dark times without talking about the circumstances there. Personally, I've literally lost sleep. I don't know about the rest of you. Um, observing things unfold. And in a conversation with my good friend, Yusuf Arafat, a former student here, we were students at the same time, um, you know, he tells me that the entire region is in a state of collective depression, both economic and psychological, as things unfold in that part of the world. You know, and as we witness that degree of destruction, devastation, dispossession, and death that's unfolding, you know, I can't be an educator, a teacher, right? And speak to some issues and pretend that others don't exist. But in addition to the repercussions for people, the people of Palestine, <clears throat> there's also repercussions and reverberations right here for all of us in terms of being told what to think or what not to think, right? Or that what we see is not what we see, right? So as somebody writing about unfreedom, right, in relation to people of African descent, right? I can't be complicit in that kind of silence of my own unfreedom. So I think where there's darkness, there's also light. So I don't want to overinvest in doom and gloom. And in so many ways, this particular book is about Black self-organization against processes of dehumanization and what that means for human freedom altogether. So I want to talk a bit about and maybe read from parts of the book, run back and forth a little bit. Um, okay, so a number of close friends have passed away since the first edition of this book. So since Forever Black Nation was first published, several close friends <clears throat> have since passed away. I dedicate this edition to the memory of Richard Eiton, who was a dear friend, former alumni of this university and author of the wonderful book, um, In Search of the Black Fantastic, Franklin Harvey, Abby Lipman, Myrtle Anderson, and Aziz Chowdhury. But also on December 24th, 2023, Nicholas Andre Spring was killed, in a, killed by prison officers while, be illegally, while being illegally detained in Montreal's Bordeaux prison. A judge had ordered his, that he be released the previous day. His death resulted from the, from the application of physical force, including being pepper sprayed twice, twice while wearing a spit hood. His arrest and incarceration, which, is, which, which resulted in his premature death, are a product of the all too familiar pattern of policing and profiling that is part and parcel of the plantation for planting <laughs> prison pipeline, which is much about what is, which is, which in large part is what this book is about. So this book is dedicated to the memory of Nikus and the many Nikuses of the world. So in the acknowledgments, that's part of the acknowledgments, but in the rest of the acknowledgments, I go out of my way 
<clears throat> to name a number of people that were not necessarily part of the book or the discussion about the book necessarily, but friends, colleagues, in some cases, folks who I had one or two con conversations with, but somehow something about that conversation or those relationships right, has shaped my thinking and understanding of the world that we live in, right? Both before this book was written and since. So I'm not gonna list all the people, but I'm saying that to say that I think it's important that we practice and model generosity and acknowledgement, right? Um, because books don't write themselves. And also, we don't write books individually. This book wouldn't have happened were it not for the many people that I've been in conversation with long before I even began thinking about writing this book. Going back to the 1990s, right? Um, <clears throat> folks that were involved in some of the movements that the book is about, folks that were not, in fact, folks are even, sometimes we're even opposed to the movements that we're talking, uh, that, um, that the book writes about, or the book talks about. Um, but in one form or another, those conversations or experiences had some bearing on my understanding. Right? And I think it's important to acknowledge that. And sometimes as intellectuals, as scholars, we don't do that enough. Right? And I think that's something that's really important for us to factor in and consider when we talk about um, how these books come into being. So, Fear of a Black Nation, Race, Sex, and Security in 60s Montreal. You know, <clears throat> it was initially going to be the introduction of a collection of speech speeches from the Congress of Black Writers in 1968 that unfolded here in Montreal. And as I began writing the introduction, you know, it got longer and longer. And at a certain point, I realized like, this was not just going to be an introduction, that this should be a book. Right? There was a whole story to be told that went well beyond the Congress, that went well beyond Sir George, and was about black self-organization in this city and its implications and reverberations in the Canadian context and across the Americas, and especially in the, Car in the Caribbean. Um, in addition to interviews, and when I was doing those interviews at the time, beginning in the 1990s, or sometimes just recording conversations that were impromptu, I had no notion of writing this book. You know, I was kind of like a independent roving journalist who would run around with a tape recorder. Um, and sometimes the things that were recorded would end up on, end up on CKUT or in the McGill Daily, or what, what was Black is Television at the time in those days, which no longer, longer exists. It was only much later that I began to delve into archives, you know, first people's personal archives, and then archives at various institutions, the George Padmore Institute in London, England, um, the archives at Wayne State University, which housed a number of archives from the work of um, CLR James and members of his organization that was based in Detroit during those days. Um, the Roy State Collection right here at McGill actually too, and at the University of West Indies. Right? Um, and over time, it became more of a kind of a research project, but always rooted in the stories that I had heard listening to these older folks, many of whom are no longer with us. Um, it's also shaped <clears throat> by a number of thinkers, theorists, and philosopher that came in various guises. So in the 1990s, I was one of those people that, <clears throat> maybe it's just part of my contrarian way to a certain extent, but when everybody was reading Michel Foucault, I decided I didn't want to read Michel Foucault because it was almost as if in the 1990s, it's a different moment now, you couldn't speak or write without citing Foucault in some form or another. But then 
I guess it was in the early 2000s. I was in New York and visiting uh, Robert Hill, who I've already mentioned, the Garvey Scholar and James Scholar and Scholar of the Black Radical Intellectual Tradition, um, who has played a seminal role in many of the events and movements that I talk about in this book. He was giving a talk at Columbia and staying in a hotel in New York. So I went to visit him and he had a book on the dresser called Society Must Be Defended, which is a collection of lectures delivered by Foucault um, in the 1970s, I think. So I became very curious that this person who I have a great deal of respect for intellectually, one of the most you know, brilliant minds that I, that I know, um, was reading this book, right? So I, I began to look at it. And when I came back to Montreal, I bought a copy of it, perused it a little bit, but it was sitting on my shelf for a while. And then some friends who were, would decide to go back to school as graduate students at the time, were reading it and talking about this book again. And it coincided with me writing or preparing Fear of a Black Nation. So, Foucault's conversation about biopolitics and biopower right, and the role of the state right, is in, implicated in almost every aspect of our lives, right? <clears throat> was really interesting for me as I was reading through and shift, sifting through these RCMP state security files, which were literally about, you know, um, capturing that moment when the RCMP was very deliberately and consciously surveilling the lives of black folks across this country who were perceived as radicals, um, um, but also many of them were actually conservatives in some instances too, right? But anybody that was organizing politically was under surveillance. And it kind of struck me that although Foucault was really insightful, very insightful actually, I've come to appreciate his analysis. Right? There was a whole biopolitics or what I refer to as biosexual politics that he had missed in relation to people of African descent. In other words, Foucault was writing about 18th, 19th century France and by extension Europe, right? but he doesn't name slavery. Right? He doesn't name the experience of people of African descent, which you know, in many respects represents the embodiment of his biopolitics, right? Right? the policing and surveilling of black bodies. Right? Um, so well, on the one hand, he was very helpful. Right? There's also a critique, a critique to be made in terms of the invisibility of the histories and experiences of people of African descent. The other thinker who was also really helpful, another philosopher I've come to really appreciate is Giorgio Agamben, the, the Italian philosopher who spent most of his life in France, right? And his conception of the state of exception, this idea that we live in a permanent state of emergency, right? <clears throat> and that the state can intervene and, can, and does intervene in all aspects of our lives through surveillance, right? But also, you know, the kind of nullification of the, of, of, you know, the right to habeas corpus, right? Innocent to proven guilty. And yet again, you know, he's talking about refugees, he talks about Guantanamo Bay and other experiences. But it occurred to me, well, that sounds precisely like the lived experience of people of African descent, not only under slavery, but an ongoing experience of policing and surveillance, right? and how the rights and entitlements afforded other people and have not historically been afforded people of African descent and indigenous peoples in, in the Americas. Right? So again, really insightful work, but then there are these absences or lack in terms of which experiences are being, being captured. And just in passing, I, I should mention that um, there's a, an article which really should be a book um, written by Brady Heiner called Foucault and the Black Panthers. It's a really interesting article in terms of thinking about Foucault's time in North America, especially given that Foucault writes about prisons, 
and the prison, prison industrial com complex and its whole analysis of Panopticon, you know, where you, there's a way, it's a way you can think about the plantation as a, an early form of what he's describing as the Panopticon, right? But that's another story. Um, but, you know, the first prison that Foucault visited was Attica Prison after the Attica Uprising of 1970. And then from there, he went to Harlem and began to observe the lived experience of people of African descent in Harlem and began thinking about the conjoining of race and class. And then he spent time in and around members of the Black Panther Party and also reading their newspaper because of his friendship with Jean Genet, the French playwright who introduced him to members of the Black Panther Party because he was close with them. Right? So there's an element of Foucault's writing that later appears not really mentioning those experiences, both historical and his contemporary experience in the United States, but is very much captured in his work. And um, uh, Brady Hines' article captures that captures that um, Foucault's experience in the United States. It's a really important article, I think. Other thinkers, <laughs> and again, I'm sort of, I'm doing this very consciously and deliberately because I, I want to kind of make the point. So yes, there's various people I've been in conversation with over the years that have contributed to this book in many ways, but these are some of the thinkers and ideas. So Glenn Coulthard, you know, writing his book, Redskin White Mass, wasn't published. Um, at the time that I was working on this book, but I did read an early article, which you know many of the ideas contained in that book are, are contained in the article. And he's really drawing on the ideas of Franz Fanon, right, as he thinks about the experiences of indigenous peoples in the Canadian context. And that book was important in terms of thinking about traveling theory, first of all, how ideas by Franz Fanon were influencing you know, indigenous peoples, French Quebecers, members of the kind of broad white left, if you want to call it that, and people from the Caribbean and African Americans and folks in England, right, drawing on the same body of ideas in relation to the particular experiences. But it also was kind of instructive in terms of thinking about Rosie Douglas, who in the 1970s was actively seeking out indigenous peoples across this country in some of the first acts of Black Indigenous solidarity and common cause right, in the 1970s. And it's precisely because of Canadian state security intervention. They brought in an RCMP, they brought in an FBI agent, Warren Hart, who was loaned to the RCMP to disrupt and to disrupt these organizations, right? That's in that led to a major breach in what was in many respects a major act of solidarity that had huge implications both for Black and Indigenous peoples. Right? So, but Glenn Coulthard's work, uh, along with the work of uh, people like Lee Maracle, who talks about Fanon when she was reading Franz Fanon's The Wretched of the Earth, and he talked about the Native, she kind of seriously jokes that in reading The Wretched of the Earth, she thought that Fanon was talking about Natives in North America. <clears throat> so, you know, there's also the work of Richard Eiton, his books, In Search of the Black Fantastic, Politics and Popular Culture in the Post-Civil Rights Era, which is really one of the best books written about diaspora um, since um, Paul Giroy's The Black Atlantic. It's an incredible book, um, but really, uh, you know, is an opening in terms of thinking about the kind of <clears throat> political nature of diaspora transcending borders and the potential beyond thinking beyond thinking beyond the boundaries of the nation state, but also as a kind of more accurate depiction of the experience of African descent, right? Who have been defined by national borders in terms of the state, but really live across these borders. And that's how it's been, been historically. Um, I also just want to quickly name three works of fiction <laughs> that were also really important. There's, <clears throat> Nigel Thomas's Behind the Face of Winter, right, which is a fictional account of the Sir George Williams protest, right, the events that occurred at Concordia in 19, what well, is now Concordia in 1969. Um, May Ruth Sarsfield's No Crystal Stair, 
which is about 1930s, 1940s, Montreal, Black population, particularly in what is now known as Little Burgundy. It captures the experience, particularly of women, but also the transnational experience of being Black in the Montreal context, but tied through the train routes um, and through Garvey's newspaper, which was circulating through train, through, you know, for folks working on their train, right? The kind of transnational conversations and relationships that existed between people from the Caribbean, but also especially between Canada and the United States, people of African descent in Canada and the United States. Um, there's also Daniel Feria's book, Comment faire l'amour? Um, which is for many people a controversial book, right? But I also think for me is a very insightful book in terms of thinking about the relationship between race, class, but particularly race and sex, which I'll come back to in terms of the title shortly, right? And how those two things have historically been entwined when it comes to people of African, African descent. Or maybe I'll just even say it right now very quickly. <clears throat> you know, take care. There's a moment um, in going through these RCMP state security files when I noticed or picked up on this preoccupation with black, white sexual <clears throat> encounters or black, folk, black men with white women, presumably in relationships. So, and it just seemed a bit bizarre and over the top and trying to figure out what the explanation was. Now, clearly, the RCMP was very much preoccupied with forms of solidarity between groups, right? between Black Indigenous solidarity, Black white solidarity, including Black solidarity with French Canadians during the heightened period of um, Quebec nationalism in the 1960s and early 70s. But this seemed to be to go a bit further. And it's, it's in reading Daniel Feria, among other things, that I realized that part of what was going on was this preoccupation with interracial relationships in which men being with, black men being with white women was almost seen, you know, was almost like, it, it was as if these men, these women's bodies came to it to, to represent or embody the purity and sanctity of the Canadian state, right? And there's a whole body of literature out there on that in terms of how women's bodies are used as a representative representation of the state, state symbolically, right? And it's almost as if these men were perceived, and, and, and this is not just me saying, this is in the archives, right? As if these men were violating the state by virtue of being in these relationships with white women. And in many instances, they were not relationships. So for example, in one instance, Carrie Levitt, Carrie Polanyi, Polanyi Levitt is mentioned, and she was she's an old friend who's now a hundred and something years old, and she would kill me, trust me, if she heard me saying this because she didn't like it when I talked about it publicly the first time. <laughs> <clears throat> but in the, one of the files, Carrie Levitt, who was you know a member of the Waffle Movement in the NDP before that was a member of the Canadian Communist Party, but she's a well-known Canadian economist who did a lot of work in the Caribbean at one point from the 1960s onwards. So there were a number of Caribbean intellectuals, mostly economists who worked with her. And at one point she ceded her apartment to them so that they had a place to stay and she moved elsewhere. And in the RCMP report, it says there are these colored men coming in and out of her apartment all day and night. Uh -huh. right? The inference being that she's somehow <laughs> in a relationship with these, with, with, with these men. And then it's qualified suggesting that, well, if it's in relation to her work, then it's fine. But if there's something else going on, then there's an issue. And this is, again, I'm paraphrasing, but this is what's going on in these, in these files. In another instant, instant, instance, <clears throat> after the Congress of Black Writers, Walter Rodney, the great historian and political actor from Guyana, um, shows up at an after party at the Congress, probably with Carrie Levitt, who he worked with, or it could have been another person who I won't mention because I think she wouldn't like me to mention it. But either way, two people would have been friends of his. And they make mention of him showing up with this quote unquote white woman 
to this event after the, you know, um, after the Congress of Black Writers. So clearly they were preoccupied for sure with this, you know, this growing solidarity between people of African descent, you know, locally and from the, or from the Caribbean and white folks, right? But clearly from the level of psychology, there was something more deeply embedded, right? And more insidious that they were, you know, preoccupied with, <clears throat> which was A, about policing and surveilling what was happening in people's bedrooms or, the, or, the, or, what, or whatever their perception of that was, but also about, again, what these women's body represented in their imagination in terms of the purity and sanctity of the state, as I, as, as I mentioned. So that's a long way of me saying that Danny LaFeria's book, where he talks about interracial sexual dynamics and encounters, um, was interesting and insightful in that sense, right? Because he kind of captured very succinctly, right? Some of what was playing out in these RCMP um, state security files. And there's also, I won't go into it, but also there's also um, uh, Lawrence, <clears throat> Lawrence Hill's The Book of ne Negroes and the character of uh, uh, Aminata, right? In terms of like thinking about diaspora and movement across boundaries and space over time. All right. Um, Maybe I'll, I'll read a little bit from, from the book. Let's see here. Just bear with me one second here. So this is just a little bit about this current version of the book. Um, actually, maybe I have to speak to some of this story somewhere after. So for, by and large, the book hasn't changed dramatically. There's a couple of additions. <clears throat> There's a new preface to the book, which I'm gonna read from in a second. Um, there's a map, which actually Richard Eiton, uh, the, their friend who passed away just, the, he passed away within a couple of weeks before the book was published. He had suggested, um, including a map, but at the time, I think the resources weren't available to, to get somebody to do the map, right? So we've added a map to the book and the map sort of maps out various places where certain events occur, but also maps out Montreal in relation to other sites of black political activity, whether it be Detroit or New York or in the UK. Right? So that's, I think is a, a useful addition. Um, and there are also, two interviews included. One that was published in the CLR James Journal back in 2014, I think, or 15. And another one that was published in a book that was edited by Aziz Chowdhury called Activists in the Surveillance State, Learning from Repression. And that's actually, you know, I mentioned Aziz as a very close friend. We used to work together also. And that's probably, that interview represents actually our our last collaboration. Um, I'm going to read a little bit from the preface. <clears throat> We've borne witness under COVID-19 conditions to the reality that viruses do discriminate, that they do not affect all people equally. The pandemic has exposed the deep structural problems affecting non-white racialized workers in the core and the periphery. Or the, or this is, that's a quote from, um, uh, who's that quote from again? Cause I don't want to, I don't want to misquote her. Anyway, it will come back to me. But in the sixties, it was surveillance that functioned like a virus, penetrating the intimate lives of the surveilled as was evident in the RCMP's attempts to police, to police what they perceive to be wayward interracial relationships and sexual encounters and sexual encounters. Sorry. The state security apparatus actions also permeated by a fear of black white political solidarity and their surveillance and repression were part and parcel of the state's presumption that in 
that it needed it needed protection from an arrestive black population. When I wrote Fear of a Black Nation, I didn't have the language that Cydia Hartman has since introduced to explore the ways that the state police black lives based on presumed intimate ties, in this case, interracial ones, or to describe the lives of black people who were not, not necessarily consciously acting politically, but whose wayward lives both shaped and confronted the established order of things. Such an analysis, as in Hartman's Wayward Lies, Beautiful Experiments, Intimate Histories of Riotous Black Girls, Troublesome Women, and Queer Radicals, captures the inherently political nature of the criminalization of not just those who are or are political activists, but also those who turn their backs on conventional society, its customs, mores, in order to survive, and in some instances thrive, precisely because society had turned its back on them. Such an analysis would consider the lives of the criminalized in general and explain why it, during the Sir George Williams occupation in 1969, black sex, black sex trade workers would give their financial support to the black protesters who had been arrested during the police raid on the computer center. Let's see here. This book's overarching thesis can be summed up in the following way. We live in the deep-seated rate, we live with the deep-seated racial codes that have roots in slavery and colonization, codes that were designed to discipline and punish people of African descent in the Americas. Black subjection to capital for the purpose of economic production. Today, these codes are deeply rooted in the, in the fear of black self-organization and black folks in general, as well as black, white, and black indigenous solidarities. This is what I describe as biosexuality, a palpable sense of dread that is embedded in the psyche and rooted in the racial codes of slavery and persists in its afterlife. Shaping our daily human encounters, including intimate relations. This thesis is somewhat lost in the euphoria and spectacle of momentous and monumental events of the Congress of Black Writers, for example, in the Sir George Williams protest. So this is me actually reflecting on how conversations about this book have kind of been reduced to two events, the Congress and the Sir George Williams protest, when actually those events for me were sort of a vehicle to have a conversation about the politics that shape those events, as opposed to the events themselves. Fear of a Black Nation implicitly poses the question that I could only explicitly oppose, pose, sorry, elaborate and appreciate once the book had been written and released from my own consciousness, allow me to further ponder its meaning and significance. These questions include, what do you do with a now surplus black population whose bonded labor produced a surplus value? I realize I'm sort of distorting Marx's notion of surplus value for a second here. Surplus value that was essential to the accumulation of wealth that facilitated the emergence of modern capitalism. What happens to the emancipated but unfree who are, who are arrested and always potentially revolutionary? This was the Du Boisian dilemma, the Du Boisian problem, in quotes, posed at the turn of the 20th century in the souls of black folks. And it is a central issue that is raised not only in the favor of black nation, but in any book that addresses post-emancipation black life. The state's response to this predicament has been repression and terror, policing and surveillance, alongside the quotidian diminishing, devaluing, and eroding of black lives within a racialized state. This is what modern classics such as Afua Cooper's The Hanging of Angelique, the untold story of ca Canadian slavery and the burning of old Montreal, among others, uh, demonstrated by opening up a space for thinking about the legal and extra legal dynamics of race in Canada. It is also what Robert Maynard's policing of black lives policing black lives, state violence in Canada from slavery to the present. And also um, 
Wendell Neilary and Jete's cross-border cosmopolitans um, have since examined in different kinds of ways. Right? In this spirit, I'd also like to highlight the work of Ronald Cummings and Nalini Mohabir's recent anthology, The Fire That Time, Transnational Black Radicalism and Sir George Williams' Occupation. The racial codes tethered to slavery are always present, even when they are unspoken or present in absentia or unvisible. This in part accounts for what I have come to refer to as the, in, since the publication of the Fear of a Black Nation as the plantation to plant to prison pipeline. The plant accounts for the mass migration tied to the, tied to, to the industrialization of black labor from south, from the south, including the global south, including the Caribbean, to the north, including the Motown to ghost town phenomenon of deindustrialization embodied in, the, in cities like Detroit, but also Montreal. And I don't know if you're familiar, Steve High has just written a beautiful book called De Deindustrializing Montreal, um, which speaks to that phenomenon in the Montreal context. A wonderful book, beautifully written. This process is characterized by surveillance and security measures, policing and prisons, and the persistence of unfreedom for the fungible and expendable a surplus population subsisting on what Sadia Hartman alternately refers to as the plantation extended into the city. Here Hartman adeptly counterposes the freedom associated with plots of land for personal cultivation in the post-emancipation period with the terror of the plantation, urban plots against the plantation and the surveillance that has had its origins, this is quoting from her, had its origins in slavery and the, admit, and the administered log, logic of the plantation, all of which persists in Northern cities as part of the reach of the plantation into the ghetto. Again, that's City Hartman's words. This logic, which has now become a much overused word in academia, logic of the plantation or the cities, Northern cities, including in Canada, engendered the surveillance and policing of the lives of Black folks, which have assumed varied forms in different contexts over time. You know, when it comes to, when it comes to Black lives in North America, as the Jamaican theorist Sylvia Winter pointed out decades ago, the result has historically been a combination of de facto segregation tied to the logic of the plantation and the ongoing criminalization, ghettoization, and incarceration of Black folks, even as a tenuous Black elite, a presumed talented tenth, <coughs> has emerged over time. Um, how much? How we have time? Yeah. I'm, I'm, okay. All right. So let me just try and wrap up, because um, I really want to make sure we do have enough time to talk. So, <clears throat> the folks that I've written about in this book <clears throat> were thinking and acting towards freedom. You know, in addition to their organizing, they were writing and reading. They wrote about France 1968, the uprising in France 1968. They wrote about the Cuban Revolution, the Vietnamese, Vietnamese struggle against American imperialism, Tanzania's Ujamaa experiment, Duvalier in Haiti, Hegel's doctrine of being, or the French philosopher Louis Althusser's contradictions and overdeterminations. For them, the world was an opening, not a foreclosure a world of possibilities, not limitations on the creative spirit. Indeed, indeed inspired by their mentor, C.L.R. James, and the writings of France Fanon, among others, they celebrated the creative capacities of so-called ordinary people, <clears throat> the capacity of the ordinary to do the extraordinary, and lived by the, by the dictum 
that philosophers have interpreted the world in various ways, but the point is to change it. A few weeks ago, I was sitting in a cafe with a friend in Ottawa as a pro-Palestinian protest passed. Naturally, I joined it, but what struck me the most was that the marchers were carrying indigenous flags, Irish flags, South African flags, and Palestinian flags. It reminded me of the internationalism and common cause that inaugurated African Liberation Day, inaugurated by people, some of whom are part of the story that is told in favor of a black nation. And African Liberation Day has been celebrated in cities like Montreal, Toronto, Windsor, New York, and around the world on May 25th. Figures like Brenda Paris from Montreal was on the executive committee of the organization that facilitated African Liberation Day. And it wasn't just a day of celebration. These are folks that raised funds for various African liberation struggles on the African continent right? and traveled there and worked there in solidarity. People like Rosie Douglas and Tim Hector were also involved in that work. Rosie Douglas was from a tiny place called Dominica, tiny island. And yet after his involvement in Sir George, after his, after his incarceration, and by the way, he was one the first person I know, you know, at least in the Canadian context, to talk about prison abolition and prison reform, but using the word abolition um, in a document that he prepared for Warren Almond, who was then uh, Attorney General. Right? Is that the, the term we use in the Canadian context? So this is the general, right? Um, <laughs> But that same Rosie from that tiny island is the person that negotiated critical resources for the African National Congress, the Palestine Liberation Organization, and the Irish Republican Army at a very critical juncture in their ongoing movement for freedom. Right? Irvin Andre has just written a book about Rosie Douglas that captures some of this history. Um, he was an important figure for both Canadian politics, for Black and Caribbean politics, for the 1960s, right? and our general conception of freedom. And watching that protest unfold reminded me of a time of internationalism, <clears throat> including the World Conference Against Racism which was really not just about race in the way that we colloquially talk about race and racism today, but it was, a, it was a conference about decolonization, which occurred in September, 2001, August, September, 2001, which I participated in actually. Um, coming back to Montreal through New York on September 10th, when the world changed. So I asked my students, you know, have you ever heard of this thing called the World Conference Against Racism? And most haven't, right? Because it's been entirely eclipsed by the events of September 11th, right? But this was a momentous event tied to a movement that began, I want to say decades before, leading up to that conference, right? Which has all but disappeared from memory. But what I want to say is that these moments of solidarity remind us that another radically different world from the world that we live in is not only possible and necessary, right? because again, the point is to change the world. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. And so we do have time for questions, and I do encourage you, if you want to pick up a copy of the book, head to the back of the room before you head out. Um, but questions from the room, if there are any, you're welcome to take those. We have a few. One and two. 
Um, so thank you so much, David, for that wonderful presentation. It's great to hear your thoughts um, in retrospect of the book, which mm -hmm. is always a creative endeavor to think about yourself in the past. Mm -hmm. For the online crowd, I'll just summarize the first part of your question, which which is tough. That was a long question for the first short question. I'll have to say, <laughs> perhaps it's a short answer, but it has to do with the the concept of necropolitics and how, though this seminal work was not published at the time of your book, now since it has been, and if there's a discourse between that concept and your work. Go ahead. And the second question, it will be a brief question on my part, to take a long answer on your part, which is, you know, how do you conceive of freedom? And then to actually thinking about freedom, acting in freedom, or acting towards freedom, and this first of like your heart and your favorite lives, all these kinds of things, right? And then other lives. So, you know, how do you understand uh, where it is in the music? Mm -hmm. <laughs> give him one moment. The second question is how do you how, how does David define the concept and the word freedom that he's used repeatedly throughout this discussion? I'll give you the hard job. <laughs> I had read one or two articles by <clears throat> Kenyan Bambi. Um, before his book came up. Um, And I like some of his work, I do. Um, I think it's important work. Um, I think, I don't know, we make choices according to, sometimes according to, if we're being honest, like when we do like research and thinking, sometimes it's even according to personal tastes, right? Um, so the language he uses didn't speak to me in the same way I think as some of the other uh, folks that I mentioned. But I do think his work is important. Of course, like he, as you mentioned, drawing on the experience of both Palestine and South Africa. Um, <clears throat> I think maybe part of my hesitation is around the necro part. Right? Not that I find it morbid per se, but like, but also. You know, I think sometimes we, and again, his work is brilliant, right? You know, um, as much as we talk about destruction and devastation and need to, right? we also need to kind of think through a language that's also affirming of life and possibilities too, right? So it doesn't always just sound like doom and gloom, you know, which is one of the reasons why I shy away from, or I'm not drawn to Afro-pessimism, conceptually. You know, for similar reasons. And I'm not saying they're the same thing. I'm not saying that Chilean baby is Afro pessimist, but yeah, I think that's how I would answer answer that. Um, <clears throat> um, <clears throat> well, freedom, talk about a big question. Uh, um, 
but an important one. And I think, I'm a bit beholden to C.L.R. James's conception of freedom. Um, <clears throat> you know, James is somebody who, I mean, think whose work I've been reading and thinking about since I was in high school. And so I was telling some folks the other day, there have been times that I've tried to run away from it because I felt he was occupying too much space in my consciousness to the point where maybe I couldn't separate my own thoughts from his. But then I find myself coming back to him always to the point where I've, I've just finished, um, well, more or less finished a book about his, about his politics. Um, I like the notion of self-organization and self-activity because it implies human possibilities again, right? It implies this idea that so-called ordinary people can organize without some kind of overarching bureaucracy um, you know, or a political body, body dictating how people lead their lives, right? It's not an argument against government. It's an argument for a different conception of government, right? Where people don't simply just govern by proxy every four or five years, but are actively involved in the politics and decision making that affect our daily lives. Right? Um, James called it socialism. Somebody can find another word for it. He sometimes drew on ancient Greece as a model because of direct democracy in ancient Greece. But of course, there are contradictions there, which don't change the model, but like there are contradictions in so far as women weren't citizens in ancient Greece. And no, and are no worse slaves, obviously. And the fact that slaves existed is, you know, says something too. But as an aspiration, the idea that so-called ordinary people can engage in politics, and this idea of direct democracy, I think is, I think is profoundly important. <clears throat> and we clearly need another model. Right? Because all the things, the litany of things that I listed at the beginning <clears throat> in terms of what constitutes dark times, right? It's the current order of things that has reproduced these problems that we live with every day, right? Um, so clearly we need another more imaginative way of living and coexisting because, you know, we live with political crisis, economic crisis, environmental, ecological crisis, right? You take any kind of metric or, you know, all these indices, that they're all leading us to the same place. And I think James had that kind of political imagination <clears throat> as it is called, you know, including for a time, for those of you, he worked with Cornelius Castoriadis for a while, the, the Greek philosopher who's a um, well, Greek French philosopher. But many of these people that I talk about in this book were, you know, James's disciples, so to speak, right? Who were preaching the same gospel. Um, carry, coming from these tiny places in the Caribbean, right? But with this expansive vision on how to change the world, right? Um, but then the short answer is like, you know, change doesn't just come about through thinking. Thinking, I think, is really important to it. We underestimate that sometimes, but like we organize for change. Right? You know, I don't believe that, you know, reading a book or what I do in the classroom constitutes change in and of itself. But I think it's an important part of the process, right? Because we think in order to do. And sometimes that's um, dismissed or not, not taken seriously. Right? So um, I think thinking tied to organizing with a vision of the world that's radically different from the present one is what's important. <clears throat> Thank you. My question for you is I see um, fear of evacuation kind of like a blueprint for uh, <coughs> self organization of people of African descent. Um, my thought is this transnational black consciousness um, or African descent, I think we call it. 
Thanks for that question. Um, so, oh my God, I'll just echo. Yeah. I'll add one thing from from the Zoom crowd. Uh, we have quite a few people who have echoed your thanks. I just want to add a chorus of invisible voices to that note of thanks. Thank you for the talk. Mm -hmm. It's very much appreciated by the people in the online room as well. After this question, which is a tough one, um, there is one more from the online crowd, and then. More. So I think in some ways you're in a better position to respond to that question than I am, <laughs> literally, yeah, for obvious reasons. Um, but that for me is also a historical question because in the 1990s, we were learning from this generation that were active in the 1960s, right? And I now see, my, my daughter was just here, she left a moment ago, like she, as a student on this campus, right, is that generation is looking to the 1990s as a moment, as a historic, what is, I'm now <laughs> part of a historical moment, which is like I'm saying I'm old, right? And I think, so each generation <clears throat> sort of redefines what struggle means, but in relation to the previous generation, because you can never escape that. Um, I think folks have learned some things from the past, right? So you look at events at like the Congress of Black Writers, for example, and, you know, I would like to think it's inconceivable that a conference like that could be organized, which was such a pivotal moment, and there could not be a single woman speaking on the podium. Right? Um, you know, our conversations around the intersections of gender, race, and class, and thinking about sexuality have changed dramatically too, right? So I think those politics are taking different forms. Um, and you know, people are organizing differently. We live in a different world. Like, when Nicka Spring was killed, you know, I was in New Jersey visiting my sister. It was just before Christmas. And my daughter was online and she says, that book was going on. Right? And, it, you know, he was from our neighborhood and somebody I'd met before. I didn't know, but met before. And then I, you know, started making some phone calls and people I know who are still youth workers, because I used to be a youth worker at one point, they still they used to work with this kid. So they organized a vigil, went to the vigil, and then there were questions around like you know, support for the family, well, you know this because you were part of it, et cetera, right? And you realize that, you know, there are certain moments where it just crystallizes and you realize like, you know, whatever else it is that you've been doing, right? Because I've been, I'm not a community organizer the way I used to be, right? I don't call myself an activist because that's, you know, that would be sort of a, diminishing what people who are activists from one day to the next actually do, right? Which is not to kind of remove myself from my own political responsibilities, right? But we decided we had to organize something, right? Which you were part of. And, you know, it involved the press, it all involved the protests. But also, what I also realized is that, like, I'm part of another generation. People are, you know, tagging people through whatever this, that, the other, and all this. I'm not on any social media. Mm -hmm. So when people started talking about, like, reaching out to people through the various, I didn't know what they were talking about. Mm -hmm. I literally, I know. So just kind of took a backseat in terms of that part and watched it unfold, right? In the end, it wasn't this idea that you can just simply organize online and have conversation. Like, it, it, it manifested itself in a public protest and public conversation. <laughs> Right, but the mechanisms that they used were very different from what we would have used in the 1990s. So it's a short way of saying, yes, things are still happening, but they happen in a different form. Um, but I don't think there's any substitute for people engaging in conversation, in dialogue and organizing together and learning from that process. The one other thing I just want to say to what hasn't changed, and this was, you know, it was evident the post-George Floyd, Brianna Taylor, et cetera, and the summer of 2020, is black political organizing 
and thought, especially when you include the Caribbean in that conversation. Fanon says, hey, Brisson, James, Eric Williams, B.S. Naipaul, you know, Derek Walcott, writers and thinkers from this tiny place called the Caribbean uh, occupied a space intellectually and politically well, well out of proportion to the size of those populations and the region, right? And I'm saying that even in our time, despite the circumstances, that continues to be the case, right? The conversation around prison abolition, yes, it disproportionately affects people of African descent and also indigenous peoples, right? But it's a conversation about radically changing how society, the society that we live in, right? Where more and more people are being incarcerated, right? For, for menial offenses, right? As part of this whole, we'll call it prison industrial, call it whatever you want to call it, right? It exists. So, you know, in those struggles, just like indigenous people, when they're fighting, you know, for dispossessed land, right? It's also a, a struggle to change like the practices associated with that extraction, environmental waste and all these other things, right? The same can be said for us, I think, in terms of, you know, these struggles to humanize our own existence is part and parcel of the struggle to humanize the world at its, at its best. And that's ongoing. The question from online is actually very similar. I believe you largely touched on it. They were looking for um, key lessons drawing from earlier periods of that, what, what you called the revolutionary internationalist time, um, and whether you could draw lessons from that time to organizers who are working today, which is very much in line with the spirit of what you just what mm -hmm. you just shared about those communities and the disproportionate represent representation of thinkers from the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. um, so I think in some ways you've spoken to this question already, and we are just about out of time. Mm -hmm. So I want to ha ask everyone online and in the room to give a round of Thank you. We'll invite you if you want to buy purchase coffee, you can pick up your coffee at the back. And thank you all for coming in. Thanks again. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. Thanks everybody for being here. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thanks for the presentation. Oh, thanks. Thank you.